Alrighty then. Welcome to another episode of Cool Dude Clem's Electronic Workshop. Welcome to Cool Dude Clem's Electronic Workshop with me, your host, Cool Dude Clem. Anyway, in today's episode of Cool Dude Clem's Electronic Workshop, I'm going to make a push-pull flyback driver. And this circuit you can see on the breadboard is going to be the brains of the circuit. Now I know I made flyback drivers in the past. I mean, I've made this triple five drivers, that SG3525 thing, and the ZVS driver and stuff like that. But anyway, what we got here is a TL494. Now these are often used in the switch mode power supplies. Like for instance, this mini fridge here, which I'm going to splice in. If we take a look at the power supply in it, you can see it's got a 12 volt, 3 amp switch mode power supply, and right at the heart of it, there it is, a TL494. So with this circuit, I can adjust the pulse width and the frequency. So, turn this circuit on, so you can see we've got the two outputs from the chip. If I adjust this, I can change the frequency. So I've got a pretty high frequency up there, pretty low frequency down here. And this one, I can adjust the duty cycle. So we're on about 50%, almost 50% right now. I can go down. I know the waveform doesn't look all that good, but that's just simply because of the way the haphazard wiring. That's usually my style. And for some reason, the camera's decided to go overexposed. I didn't touch anything, it just did it all by itself. So I have absolutely no idea what the hell is up with this stupid camera. Now another interesting thing about this circuit is there's sort of two modes of operation. Now, in this configuration you can see that we've got an almost 50% duty cycle. If I just zoom in on that, you can see that at no point both outputs are high at the same time. So I could connect a couple of MOSFETs to that, and a center tapped primary, and I could have a push-pull flyback driver. Of course, I would have to put in a circuit to discharge the MOSFET gates, because this chip has no way of doing that. But that's all going to come later. Anyway, like I was saying, if I take pin 13 here, and connect that to the ground, we now have a different mode of operation where both outputs are the same and we can get from absolutely nothing to almost a hundred percent duty cycle. Let's say that's somewhere between 90 and 100. So I could use that for things like dimmers and motor speed controls and things like that. So let's have a look see what our output frequency is at the moment. Try and probe one of these without shorting anything out. So probe right here. At the moment, we're at about 33 kilohertz. So, let's see what the lowest frequency is: 24 kilohertz, which seems a bit strange. It shouldn't be that high. And the highest frequency: 116 kilohertz. Okay, so I'm now going to put it back in the other mode. I don't think that needed to be connected here. Let's get the alternating outputs. And now you'll notice that the frequency has actually gone down in half. Because now we've got 58 kilohertz. And at the bottom of the barrel, all the way down, we're at about 6 kilohertz. Although you couldn't actually see the meter, but there it is. So that would be good for driving things like flybacks. And the good thing about in this mode is that the duty cycle will never go over 50%. So now we know that all works. Let's do some more things with the circuit. So anyway, this is the circuit that I'm basing mine on. Now, no disrespect to the person who came up with this circuit, but it really is not all that good. So I've made a few changes to this. Now, I've taken pin 13, 
and instead of connecting it to ground and these pins here, pin 13 is now connected to these pins here instead. So that makes sure the duty cycle doesn't go over 50% and both the output pins, although you can only see one here, take it in turns to produce the pulses. Also, instead of just using a resistor to connect the chip to the MOSFET, I'm going to put another little circuit between that, which will drive the MOSFET better. So, anyway, what you can see here is two chips. Up here I've got a 555 timer, and down here I've got a TL494. Now, obviously I haven't drawn in everything that's in the chip, just the parts that matter, so... There's the control circuitry here and the green box labeled stuff on both the chips there and got the output transistors in the TL494 and the output transistors in the 555 timer. So if you connect a 555 timer to a MOSFET it's no big deal really. It's not going to have any trouble driving the MOSFET gate and this is why. So when the chip goes high this transistor turns on and power can flow from the positive and into this transistor, then out of pin 3, into the MOSFET gate, no trouble. And when the chip is in its low state, this transistor turns on instead, so the charge from the gate can go through that transistor and into ground, which discharges it, no trouble. However, the TL494 has nothing that can do that, so you connect a MOSFET to there, that charge is going to stay on the gate a lot easier. So, need to do something about that. And I've come up with two solutions here. Two circuits, which the lower one is one I might use. But anyway, let's talk about how this circuit works first. Now, this would be placed between the MOSFET and the TL494. So what happens is that when the chip goes high, power flows out of the TL494's output pin and into this transistor. But it also goes into this diode here where the voltage gets dropped just a little bit. And because this is a PNP transistor, and we've got a lower voltage at the emitter than what we do at the base, the transistor turns off. So at this point, it might just as well not be in the circuit. And the power can flow into the gate with no trouble. But when the chip goes low, power stops flowing. So we now have zero volts at the PNP's base. And the charge from the MOSFET gate will flow back into the circuit, but obviously it won't be able to get through the diode, so it goes through the transistor instead, and because the voltage at the emitter is higher than what we have at the base, the transistor turns on, and the gate can discharge itself through it. Now, the active circuit is a little bit more simple. It's a lot like the output transistors in the 555 timer. So, when the chip goes high, the power flows out of the output pin, and goes into this transistor, turning it on, and then this transistor conducts the 12 volts and sends that into the MOSFET gate. However, when the chip goes low, this transistor turns off and this transistor turns on instead. The charge comes back out from the MOSFET gate through this transistor and into ground and it's nicely discharged. So now I'm going to try and demonstrate how the charge can stay on a MOSFET gate. I've got a battery and a MOSFET and an LED. And I'm going to charge the MOSFET gate with the battery. And I'll connect it to the LED. And I don't know if you saw that, but there was a very brief and somewhat faint flash from the LED. Alright, so with the lights turned way down, we should be able to see this, although somewhat grainy, so I'm discharge I mean charging up the MOSFET gate. There, did you see it? Let's just do that one more time. And maybe just one final time, hopefully. Let's just top that up a bit more. And hopefully, you saw the LED flash as I discharged the gate. Okay, so I'm going to do a little experiment now. Now I've got the chip oscillating at about 40 kilohertz, and on the scope you can see we've got a nice good square wave. But let's see what happens when I connect a MOSFET to the chip without any kind of intermediate stage. In fact, the only thing that is going to be between the MOSFET and the chip is this 22 
ohm resistor right here. So here's the MOSFET. So I'm just going to connect across the chip. And as you can see, this is not a very good waveform. This is not the kind of waveform you want at your MOSFET gate. Okay, sure, at the start of each pulse we've got a nice steep rising edge, but at the end of each pulse it's just slowly ramping down. In fact, it doesn't even get to zero before the next pulse starts. It's absolutely terrible because of that parasitic capacitance in the MOSFET itself. So let's put in an intermediate circuit and see how well that works. Okay, so you saw how well it works with no intermediate stage. So, I've built up the passive intermediate stage. So now, when I connect the MOSFET, if I could just get it on there, as you can see, the waveform at the gate is now a hundred times better. And that's the kind of waveform we want, but we can get even better than that. Okay, so here we are with the active intermediate stage. And if I put the MOSFET on this, you can see that there and I can get that on there, that there is almost no change, like the other circuit, there is almost no change to the waveform whatsoever. Although for some reason it shows up a little easier on the scope when I connect the MOSFET. And this is the circuit that I am going to go with, because I just think that's a little bit better. It's a little easier on the chip. Okay then, so now it's time to test out this thing and see how well it works. So I've still got the circuit built up on the breadboard. I've still got the circuit built up on the breadboard. Here I've put in some MOSFETs and diodes. Even though I'm only using one of the MOSFETs at the moment. And over here, a dinky little flyback. But this is just to test out the thing to see how well it works. Alright, so this is the circuit that I've come up with so far. So what you see here is what I've got over there. And of course, if you don't want to use audio modulation, you can just omit these three components here. That's this capacitor and these two resistors. But of course, I do want to do audio modulation, so that's why they're in. Now eventually, the circuit is going to become this. This is what I'm going for. Where we've got a center touch primary, two MOSFETs, and of course, everything else. So, with all that said, Let's see if this thing works. Yep, alright. So anyway, that's about 17 kilohertz at about a 25% duty cycle. Now what I want to do is reverse the primary connections on the flyback just to make sure that I've got the primary the right way around and I'm getting the most out of the flyback. Of course that won't matter when this becomes a push-pull circuit because, well, the primary is going to get pulsed both ways, so it really doesn't matter. Okay, so this is with the connections on the primary reversed. So let's see if it arcs with the primary the other way around. Much better, actually. Well, I can't help myself, I haven't done this for so long. I've got to try a singing arc experiment, so I've got my mini disc player hooked up to this thing right there through this capacitor. And you can see the audio modulation on the scope right there. So let's give it a listen. Yep. Hope you can hear it. Yep. Okay then, here is the circuit in all its push-pull glory. Got all the transistors connected, although... I still don't think that's the best way. I should really use a gate driver chip because... That way the gates will be driven properly, but, you know, this will do for now. So, there's the control circuitry, there's the quote-unquote gate driver circuits, there's the two MOSFETs, a couple of diodes, and then that's going off to the flyback's primary. I've got the flyback connected here. I've decided to connect a 470 microfarad capacitor across it just to give it some resonance. It's just what I had on hand at the time. So, let's switch it on and see if it works. 
And there we are. I guess you're wondering why I'm not hurting myself when I touch this vice, which it's arcing to. Vice is grounded, so zero volts. MOSFETs are still cold, and uh, it's rather ZVS-like arc there, or at least it is. When I move it there. And yes, I can even do audio modulation with this thing. So I'm just going to set this to a very thin arc. I don't know why the waveform gets so weird when it's arcing, but I'm just going to make that a nice thin arc so you can see it's now. It's nowhere near as intense as it was before. Actually, I want you to see if you can recognize this song because it's driving me mad because I have absolutely no idea what the name is. Alright, that's enough of that because, you know, the copyright Nazis will probably get me for that, but, yeah, it works pretty good. Okay, well, I just decided to try it with another flyback, and I think this flyback is bad because, for one thing, there's almost no output at all, no matter what frequency I try it on. And also, there appears to be no continuity between any of the pins on the back and the output wire. Because, you know, to find out what the ground pin is, I set my power supply on to about 20 volts, then put my meter on the end here, and then uh, put the power supply on. Ah! Well, there's still a little bit of charge on that. See? I got a shock, even though it was turned off. And I'm still here. I'm not dead. Didn't actually hurt. Just took me by surprise more than anything else. See? Still here with a new haircut and my 4,000 billion chins but yeah, like I say, I think this flyback is dead unlike me because there's just no continuity between any of the pins at the back here on this thing even though when I was testing for which pin is which I set the power supply to about 20 volts which should be enough to turn on the internal diode I think that flyback's busted so later on I'll go through my flybacks and see if I can find one that works better because that one you saw earlier is not exactly my best flyback. As a matter of fact, this is the best I've ever got out of it. So, um, so I can only assume it's going to work better when I use it with a better flyback. Anyway, no time for that now because the mail is here. And I'll see you in that video. So, until next video, goodbye.